Hello and welcome to After Scientology, Straight Up and Vertical, the weekly show where Tony Ortega and I get together and discuss the events in the world of Scientology as reported on Tony's Substack. Uh, hey, Tony, welcome back. Uh, good to be back. We missed last week, didn't we? We did. We did. I was in Portland and uh, I was gone all weekend and man, what a weekend. So we didn't get a chance. And so here we are today. I was traveling too. Ah, right. Okay, cool. Well, uh, we're glad to be back, folks. <laughs> and um, and I have said, by the way, just to just to put this out there, uh, since this is on my channel here, that I have recently completed my work in terms of discussing, breaking down, explaining Scientology. There won't be more videos about that on my channel. It's it's all there for you. But this show is going to continue every week. Tony and I have a have a great thing going here, keeping up with Scientology every week, and I want to keep doing that. So. Uh, so you'll you'll not see any break in this show. Uh, and you finished up on the e meter. Way I to go! Did. Thank you, thank you. It was all promises kept. I have I have fulfilled my obligations, <laughs> and uh, and what a cap, you know, what a cap. Finally, like uh, put quit on that stupid religious artifact. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, there was some interesting stuff in this last week, starting off with um, a 1994 interview I did not know had occurred with David Miscavige that was apparently German language only until it was translated. What? How did you find this? What was this all about? Yeah, I looked around and I didn't see anything online. Um, Peter Reichelt is this Austrian journalist who's been doing stuff forever. He did a wonderful... He worked with uh, German TV back in the 90s, and one of the very first examinations of Int Base. Oh. I actually flew airplanes over Int Base back in the 90s. <laughs> wow. um, and yeah, and uh, he's he his, he's the one that really exposed uh, Gottfried Helmwein's involvement in Scientology because he had actually worked for him. Oh, um, yeah. Interesting guy. And then he mm -hmm. kind of went away for a while, and now he's back. He's been giving us a few items. Always great to hear from him. And um, out of the blue, he said, Tony, I want you to know about this interview Miscavige gave him. Like, what? Right. Because, you know, David Miscavige is currently with Scientology. is notorious for avoiding the press. And so this now, we, we now know that he's given, that we know of, four interviews in total in the 37 years that he has run Scientology. The very first one, of course, was his live interview with Ted Koppel on Nightline in yeah. 1992. That was a disaster. Uh, a few years later, and I'm sorry I don't have an exact date. I need to nail it down. But a few years later, he gave a more canned uh, interview with NBC. It was not live. They, clearly, if you've seen parts of it, um, they had a little more control over what was going on. And Alex Gibney, years later, used footage from that interview for going clear. So you yeah. see Dave, like, preparing stuff and in kind of a casual setting. That's from that NBC thing. Okay. So two television interviews that we're aware of. And then two print interviews now. And, we, we, you know, a long time we've known that 1998, he gave a print interview to Tom Tobin uh, of the St. Petersburg Times, now the Tampa Bay Times. And, you know, the reason why he did that then was the, the 1998, the Lisa McPherson crisis was at its worst, right? That's right. And the church itself had been indicted criminally and was being sued over the death of Lisa McPherson. And so uh, I'm sure very reluctantly, David Miscavige decided to give an interview uh, to the Tampa Bay Times about that with Tom, Tom Tobin. So we've known about those three for a long time. But it turns out in 1994, his first print interview was with an Austrian weekly investigative magazine uh p-r-o-f-i-l i i you know i'd say profile but i'm not exactly sure how they say it but anyway um very apparently it was very well known in vienna at the time very uh very uh well regarded and why would david miscavige give a print interview in 1994 in in austria well if you remember in those days there was a real crisis in germany with scientology mm -hmm. um and germany was really cracking down Dave uh, reacted by putting out an advertising campaign saying that Scientologists in Germany were being treated like Jews in the 30s, and that created a firestorm. So mm -hmm. with that you know, going on, he decided to go ahead and give an interview to a German-language magazine in Austria that he knew would be read in Germany. 
but I, I hadn't heard about it. And so uh, Peter translated it. I asked for the original scan so I could double check the translation and tweaked a few things because there are some odd responses from Miscavige and people were really uh, interested in some of the things he said. You know, there's uh, at one point he has kind of a I am not a crook moment where he says, mm -hmm. I'm not a money launderer, you know, um, really kind of unwise for him to talk about it, say it that way. But, you know, I, I want to caution people because this interview with this journalist Wolf Lauder was done on the 11th floor at the HGB building in 1994. Mm -hmm. That magazine then translated it all into German. Then we're translating it back into English. So keep that in mind that it's not going to be word for word what Dave said. It's probably right. pretty close. Right. But we've asked uh, Lauder, the um, uh, Austrian journalist, to see if he can't dig out those audio tapes and maybe we can see what Dave actually said. <laughs> But a uh, really interesting interview where he says there's eight to ten million Scientologists. Yeah. He deny he denies that um, there's any money laundering going on, but he does say that it's worth three or four billion dollars, which in 1994 that's pretty amazing for him mm -hmm. to admit that. But he was talking about property. Uh, you know, we got some other valuations later on about the the how much the companies are worth. But uh, really interesting interview where he's kind of on the defensive. He uh, apparently uh, Peter Reichel did interview Lauder for this piece, and Lauder said that he was, you know, Miscavige was super upset with how the interview ended up coming out, and sent him a really angry letter. We've we've asked him to see if he can't find that too. <laughs> I don't know if we will, but uh, really interesting stuff. And I, I think we will have a little more about how that interview uh, came together. We got a little bit from Wolf Lauder, but another person that was involved. Um, we're working on something with them. So uh, I don't know. Isn't it amazing to get this interview out of the blue and see how Dave was describing things in 1994? Oh, very, very much so. In fact, I wanted to comment on the fact that uh, I was surprised to see him personally say eight to 10 million members because I'd seen Kirstie Alley assert something like that. Heber Gench earlier would throw around Bandy about millions of members. But to see him put numbers on it like that and coming from the top, knowing full well, he's absolutely full of it. If there's anyone who knows how many Scientologists there are, it's David Miscavige. And, and having right. seen the list, I know for a fact it's never been millions of members. So um, so that's just a straight up lie. The anger, the nine mile crook moment, the how dare you, right, uh, sort of approach to being accused of criminal activity or money uh, shenanigans was interesting because that was in the written piece a, 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 an obvious blow up that's happening he's responding kind of you know rat-a-tat-tat -tat to the other questions but then suddenly you know I, I don't have to i don't have to put up with that i think is what he said and it was like dude you're doing an interview that's that's the whole point is people are going to ask you questions right so um so I, I'm positive, of course, that his response, that his anger letter is going to be along the lines of, you know, how dare you even ask me these questions, right? Uh, it, it pretty typical Scientology stuff. Four interviews in the space of, what's it been now, 35 years, years of running this, this operation? 37 years. 37 years, right? Four interviews. I mean, I called him out yesterday in my Q&A. I do this frequently, you know, as a, as a coward. He's a coward. He hides. Yeah. And, he, and, yeah. he doesn't, and he doesn't need to come out, which is really the reason why he doesn't. Um, because it's noteworthy, just as a final point on this, that each time he did, it was a flap handling. It was there was a situation that he was trying right. to deal with, and he was probably pissed because he has people to deal with these things, and they didn't deal with it, right? And so now he has to come in uh, with the Time Magazine article, with the you know, with the Lisa McPherson stuff, with you know these reasons why he had the German situation, right? Kurt Weiland, head of OSA, why aren't you dealing with this? And I thought it was funny that the reporter compared them to Tupperware salesmen. <laughs> he knew what was up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, 
Also in the news this last week, uh, not surprising, but, you know, oh, God damn it, with these legal things, um, that appeal on the judge change or switch, or what was this about? What what happened this last week on that? Yeah, so we've talked about it before that in uh, Jane Doe 1's lawsuit, the forced marriage lawsuit, uh, a Scientology naturally, they do this with any former Scientologist who sues. They try to force it into arbitration and say right. that you've signed a contract and you, you agreed not to sue us. You can't do this. And, uh, you know, this judge, we weren't sure about this judge. There were some signs that maybe he was going to go along with it like other judges had. But then the night before the April 16th scheduled hearing, he posted a tentative ruling that was kind of amazing and said, look, you know, uh, first of all, he thought her ex- you know, explanation for how the thing she signed wasn't really what it appeared to be. He th- thought she was credible. That was good. But then he was like, but even if you just look at the agreement, it's too one-sided. It's too unfair. It meets the de- legal definition of unconscionable. And, I, you know, that morning, I, I real late at night, I saw that. I wrote it up for the morning and said, this is going to be an incredible day. Uh, finally, a judge is going to rule that this legal game that Scientology plays is unfair. Well, that morning, before the hearing could start, Dave's attorney, Jeffrey Riffer, went down to court and said, look, we've accepted service now. David is making his first official appearance in the lawsuit and so the lawsuit is only on day one for him. It might be a year and a half old for Jane Doe, but today is day one for David Miscavige. And so he then has the ability, as his first official act, to remove you. And so he files a peremptory challenge, removes the judge, literally in those few hours between the time he had proposed to rule that Scientology arbitration was unconscionable and the hearing when he was actually going to do it. Yeah, incredible. It's so yep. cynical, and it re- and the only way he could do that is because he had been sandbagging the court, um, evading service, hiding behind security guards. I mean, it's just so cynical and unfair. Yep. So Jane Doe one had filed a petition with the appeals court asking them to take a look at this and, and grant her a writ, and basically, uh, you know, have the appeals court look at it and overturn it and say, yeah, Miscavige did this for improper reasons which she's absolutely right. Uh, and the appeals court said, no, no, we're, it, it, he followed the rules. And it's one of those times when following the rules is over here and justice is way the fuck that, over here. It's, Sorry. It's right. So, That's right. you know, it's just so outrageous that, yes. you know, that, that David Miscavige can game the system like that be, because he's a wealthy, unprincipled, you know, totalitarian leader and the courts go along with it. So yeah. just really, really um, depressing that the courts are being gamed like this and are going along with it. Absolutely. And especially from the appeals court, I'm not sure. Um, uh, usually it's different judges in the appeals section, right? It's not the same judge who's who's right. doing the ruling. Um, and, and she has had luck at that level before. That, right. that particular appeals court has ruled in her favor with the other Jane Doe's in the Masterson lawsuit. Uh, they got a real good re- re- result uh, from that court uh, a year and a half, two years ago. So I think that's part of what was motivating her to go there. I said, look, well, these people are enlightened, right. but not this time. So now, but let's keep, now, this does not mean, however, that she's been forced into arbitration. What it means now is they're going to bring in a new judge. They're going to have to wait for that judge to get up to speed and then ask them again the same question. Now right. that that new judge may also come to the same conclusion that Judge Broadbelt did. So, this, yep. you know, Miscavige is taking a risk there, but uh, we don't know yet, and they're fighting over which judge it's going to be. Um, so it's going to be a while yet. But it's, it, does, it does seem so amazing that that incredible ruling was sitting there for a few hours, and before it could be made final, now it's just gone. Now, I'm sure they'll show it to the next judge, but uh, I don't know if it'll influence them or not. No, it was a real uh, ace in the hole kind of move, and uh, and it really should have, it, they shouldn't have been able to get away with that because, as you said, it was just so obviously cynical. Context really does matter in these situations, and that's what we have judges for. It doesn't have to be purely procedural, right? We have human beings who can look at the data, but it doesn't look like they they kind of did in this case, right? It was just nope, procedure over rightness whatever justice Ugh. um okay different different story 
very interesting. Um, an entire Scientology event has been scrubbed. A recent one. Not some distant you know, past thing. What 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 was this? I mean, you, you you know how Scientology is. They love to keep records about themselves. Oh yeah. And you know, especially their events. Dave loves to have photos of himself up at their websites, giving speeches and the kind of thing, going mm -hmm. back years and years. And uh back in March, I was interested in which celebrities have been showing up at recent events. Yeah. Now that Dave is coming out of the pandemic and trying to get the events back to their original places, but he's lost Kirstie Alley and Kelly Preston and Chick Corea, uh, Laura Prepon, Beck. He's lost a bunch of big names. So who's showing up at these new events? And it was interesting to see, for example, at the last LRH uh, birthday event, uh, this one that just happened a month and a half ago, John Travolta was there with Elizabeth Moss. Um, and, you know, we're, I'm still seeing these tabloid stories about how John Travolta is moving away from Scientology. He's less involved. What, did they not see my story? He was there. Right. Anyway, so um, so I, I've been looking at a number of different events that have happened since the first one that they brought back uh, after the COVID lockdowns was the March 2022 L. Ron Hubbard birthday event. Now, they couldn't go back to Ruth Eckerd Hall yet. In Clearwater, so they just had it in the auditorium. So it was a smaller That's at the Fort right. Harrison Hotel. That's right. The auditorium at the Fort Harrison. So it was a smaller event. Yep. Um, but you know, Nancy Cartwright was there, Trish Duggan, Marisol Nichols, James Barber, the uh, opera singer, um, Catherine Bell, Michael Roberts, uh, my, uh, Matt Feshback, uh, Craig Jensen. A lot of big names uh, in the Scientology world were at this event even though it was smaller and that was kind of the comeback yeah and then uh the next year in 23 in march when they had the birthday event i saw that michael pena was there so that was interesting because i hadn't seen him at a birthday event so, so there were some you know celebrities stepping up uh and then like i said in 24 he then in the last six months he's tried to restore them to their original places so the ias was held at saint hill tom cruise showed up um, the New Year's event was back at the Shrine Auditorium. Erica Christensen was there. And like I said, this last LRH uh, birthday event in Clearwater, Elizabeth Moss was there. So I've, I've been looking at these events again and, and you know, uh, thinking about that. And I just went back, Chris, I just went back to double check what was all there. The 2022 L. Ron Hubbard birthday event at the Fort Harrison Hall Auditorium, the one where they kind of got things going again like it never existed right. poof it's gone they got rid of it at their regular main website their news website their david miscavige website they even got rid of it at archive.org and i didn't even know you could do that wow yeah wow so, uh, so no stry sand effect for this one <laughs> <laughs> they do not want anybody to know that that thing happened. Wow. And I don't know why. I asked Mike Rinder what he thought. He suggested that possibly because it did look so much smaller. Now, nobody would think anything of that because they were just coming back from COVID. They couldn't go to Ruth Eckert Hall. But maybe Dave's ego was bruised that he wasn't in, such, in front of such a big crowd. Maybe. Maybe that's it. We just don't know. But it's weird, isn't it? Well, it is very weird, and it's weird in a way that makes me feel that I'm wondering if somebody prominent wasn't featured there that couldn't be cut or edited or something that they'd want to erase. I wonder if somebody there got declared, you know, that's the other thing that could have happened that they will go back and erase the archives. They will go back and remove stuff. When somebody prominent, okay, Larry Anderson, the, the orientation film, right? They're not still showing that thing. This guy's a declared SP. Anything that had Jason Begay in it, that shit's gone, right? So right. that's another possibility. I'm not saying Mike is wrong. I don't know, but I will throw out yeah. that that other idea, um, yeah. which makes me a little hopeful because you just listed a whole bunch of Scientology luminaries, even if they are D-list actors. <laughs> uh, you know, some of those people are pretty prominent and it might well be that one of them has exited stage left and, uh, and it needs to be erased.
Could be. Maybe that's it. Could be. Uh, or a combination of the above. It's certainly not beyond the possibility that it's an ego hit for Dave. It absolutely could be. Um, but it just smacks of that, you know, disappearing people kind of flow for yeah. me too. Okay. Um, now this was an, this was an, this was an interesting story because, you know, periodically during the year, you will highlight or spotlight the whales, the people who give lots of money to Scientology. And, it, and we know about Venezuelan millionaires and oil tycoons and, you know, and the prominent name, the short list of the Feshbacks and the Craig Jensen's. But there was a story this week uh, where uh, you highlighted some, you know, hap- the, the HAPI, Happy Org, and uh, and some news out of Detroit. And it, it w- can you just describe that all first? Sure. So, you know, uh, thankfully I have readers that forward stuff to me that are, they're still on mailing lists. Yeah. And so I got uh, an email that had been sent to people from the Scotland, Edinburgh uh, group, they're trying to raise money for an ideal org they have for years and years. It, you can tell it's just a very small, not productive place. And I just thought it was interesting to see the language in it because it was kind of pathetic. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, we've had 10 people in this month. You know, I mean, it just it just came off really, really uninspiring. Right. And so I just I just thought people would be interested in seeing that. But it was kind of an interesting contrast to then I also got a flyer you know, Battle Creek, Michigan. This is a this is such a mystery, Chris. I you know they Scientology just gets things in, in its mind and then it just will not let go. So, you know, okay, I understand you. You need to have an ideal organ in Detroit and Chicago and Philadelphia, but Battle Creek, Michigan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Battle Creek, Michigan needs a twenty five million dollar Scientology cathedral. Yep. And so they're just hang, you know, haranguing these people for money and money. So uh, this was a Detroit couple that were being celebrated because they've given 55 humanitarians to the ideal org cause. Now that's Scientology code for one humanitarian. You're, you're, in a, you're a humanitarian, not because you do good things for other people, but simply because you've given Scientology a hundred thousand dollars. That's right. So fifty-five X humanitarian, that's five and a half million dollars from this one couple. Yep. In Detroit. Yep. Well, I looked him up and he's an admiralty law lawyer. <laughs> Which, you know, these days, of course, I just immediately started thinking of sovereign citizens and all right. that craziness. <laughs> <laughs> who start you know they 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 cite admiralty law so they don't have to have driver's licenses and license plates right, right? that's right but, no but this guy does legit admiralty law you know ships that crash and whatever right. um but five and a half million dollars one detroit couple i don't know it just especially when you know how how you know difficult things are for scientology now uh, the pandemic, but also in general with recruiting, they still are able to get these huge amounts from people that I guess are still convinced that this is a going thing. Isn't yeah. it amazing? It very much is. And of course, it often looks like, you know, without trying to be ageist, I'm just making a joke here, but it really does look like the whales are a geriatric club. I mean, it's it's older people. And I doubt these are people who are really cruising through social media or keeping up on, you know, the latest and greatest with things when it comes to Scientology and, and all the things connected with it. Um, the other thing that I thought about this that I thought was worth commenting on is the sort of long-term genius strategy of investing in these buildings goes beyond the real estate valuations of them and the, and the, and the ability to have stable locations that aren't going to be, um, you know, being kicked out of their quarters every other month because they're not making their rent. And, and, and this used to be a really big problem for Scientology. Um, is that is that you know the, the 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 property tax payments or the the lease payments or the rent payments they they just weren't making enough money to keep them in the, in the place. Uh, I watched the Valley Org move locations four times within the course of about three years uh, because of this kind of thing back in the nineties. 
So the ideal org thing, the whole strategy, solves that problem, and it, and it solves right. it in a you know in a in a in a in a sensible way. But what it also opens the door to is these statuses, these humanitarian statuses, these glorious you know ideal org builder statuses that. Uh, uh, that Nancy Cartwright is, it, it, you know, has claimed about a, a hundred of. Um, what you have here is a way for Miscavige to get an infinite amount of money from his parishioners, because the because 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 Hubbard said, sell the books, sell the services, get people up the bridge. That's how you make the money. But if you think about it. It sounds like an incredible amount of money to do the bridge to total freedom. It's about a million, 1.5 million to do the whole thing. Well, these guys have given 5.5. They've bought right, right. bridge after bridge after bridge, and they're not, and the, and the church isn't obligated to do a damn thing for them because right. this is just straight up you money, know, right? Mark, Mark Headley broke it down for me really well one time. He said, look, flag the flag land base it, it is the engine. Yep. That, that really makes more money than all the other orgs combined. Correct. And when it was when it's going well, you can get two million a week out of that place. So that's a yep. hundred million dollars a year. But it's a lot of work. You got to convince people to come. You got to put them through courses. You got to have all kinds of auditors and grammars yeah. and all this stuff. It's a very involved process, and you end up with a hundred million dollars. And Mark said, at some point, Dave said, or I get ten rich guys to give me ten million each. That's right. It's the same amount, and there's no work, and you don't have to give them anything. So I, you know, he. I think that's a good explanation for how the thinking has changed in the last 20, 25 years, yep. less and less emphasis on the services and more and more just on straight donations. And then with the ideal org program, not only do you get donations, but you end up with real property that is going to hold its value to at least a certain extent. I mean, you know, some of these buildings are kind of unusual and maybe they won't be the the best I mean, you know, we've seen them sell at a loss before. Yeah. So um, they may not be the best investments, but they're, I mean, you know, it's, it, it pays to have a lot of property like that. That's right. So yeah, five and a half million from one lawyer and his wife, Dave's still, you know, he's Rolling still got it. it that way. He, That's he's right. He's good at getting money out of people. Oh, it's, it's a tremendous operation. I mean, it's very, very clever if you actually just step back and, and, and just look at the mechanics of it. Um, and clearly, they are using this uh, as an effort to buy out Clearwater. That's where their focus is, is, is buy Clearwater. And, and I think that there are people who honestly believe that they're going to stop, that they're going to that, that, that they're going to be exposed, that somehow, you know, Dave is going to um, be regulated out of doing that or somehow that's not going to occur. And I'm just here to tell you, they're never going to stop and they're going to keep purchasing properties in Clearwater until some until someone forcefully stops them because the plan is to take over that town. And, and I, I just don't know how to put it more plainly. You know, well, and and with and with Clearwater, with the flag land base, the basic fact that people need to understand is that that's their financial engine. Yes, they've got they've already got people coming. They don't want outsiders. They don't want to. They're not recruiting anybody there. That's right. They just want to keep outsiders away, and that's why they buy property and just sit on it. That's right. That's they're not exactly going right. to do anything with it. They just they don't want a, re, a revival of downtown. They've got it exactly the way they want it. That's right. And so they've bought up every piece of property they can just to keep it the way it is. I, you know, if you think he's buying up property because he's going to make some big thing out of it, he's no. He just they like the way it is now. They've got people from Spain and Taiwan and South Africa all flying to Clearwater, Florida to drop several hundred thousand dollars in the process of a month and then fly home. Why would they change anything? Exactly. You know? Exactly. As far as they're concerned, the citizens of Clearwater, the government of Clearwater, the people there are insignificant. They're 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 in their way. They just they're yeah. just they're just pieces to get out to get off the board. That's And so when that, the local know. government there talks about putting in a Gordon Biersch across the street from the Fort Harrison Hotel, that's like Dave's worst nightmare. He that's doesn't right. want outsiders seeing what they're doing. Just leave us alone. Let us 
do our thing. And, you know, the people of Clearwater are the ones that pay the price because they've got this dead downtown. But obviously, they're not worked up enough to do anything about it themselves. So I don't know. At this point, Chris, I'm... I've kind of given up myself. I mean, because it, because it's because I, I you, you, they've been told and told and told since the 1980s. This is a ruthless organization that is not going to stop, and they just don't believe them. They just keep thinking, "Oh no, no, no! They're really nice people." I had a talk with them. David Miscavige, you know, laid it all out for us, and it's all good. And they're just so desperate to play nice, they just won't look at it plainly for what it is um okay well finally speaking of looking at it like it is this was a fun story the Hartwells, uh and you you your assessment of this what was this about well uh so i've got this helper he's really great he just dives through old newspaper archives and finds me some really cool things once in a while um if you know if you've read bareface messiah if you've read uh, by R- russell miller if you've read uh, john atax piece of blue sky you may remember this incident it's really key and uh but i hadn't seen this particular clip before and i thought people would want to see it too um you know after running scientology from c between 1967 and 1975 hubbard came back to the u.s was in Florida for a short time and then ended up in the California desert where he decided, um, well, then the, then the uh, raid happened in LA and DC. Yep. He went into hiding. And I think what's really important is while he's in hiding, Star Wars is a phenomenon That's in right. theaters That's right. in the summer of 1977. While Elrond is hiding out in Nevada the lines you all you all remember well those of us are old enough remember right. the lines <laughs> around the block to get in to see what space opera the stuff he was writing back in the 30s and so he he was inspired and he wrote a screenplay while he was hiding called revolt in the stars it's revolting all right i've read the thing it's horrible yeah and basically yeah. he was going to turn ot3 the xenu uh, story into a movie yep. and it didn't go anywhere but he then went to this um southern california desert location and started to make movies mm-hmm. and got a crew together a young crew and he was the director and they made these really bad films for a while well it turns out that one couple that was brought in to help were adele and ernie hartwell who were from las vegas they had like a dance troupe. They had like four performances. Oh, they're talented. Bring them in. Because their their daughter was, was a messenger. And they spent, I don't know, six or eight months in the desert helping uh, make these films. Got fed up with it. Left. They were then threatened by Scientology with a fair game campaign. So then, okay, we're going public. They went public. They went public in January 1980. They told wonderful stories about what... It was really like around L. Ron Hubbard that he was screaming at people, that his language was filthy, that he was the director and the writer and everything for every film. And he was the boss. You you couldn't call him Hubbard. You couldn't call him Ron. You had to call him the boss for security reasons. One thing that wasn't in that clip, Chris, I want to tell you about was the other thing she said was that he was obsessed with blood and gore in their film shoots. And they would just mix up gallons and gallons of, of corn syrup and yes. red uh, you know, <laughs> color and just throw it on the actors. And, and Ron would say, more, we need more blood, more gore. They got, it got so, they threw so much blood on these actors that at some points they had to cut their costumes off because they were completely, you know, soaked to them. Uh, just hilarious. Yeah. yeah. You just, you know, you know, it's that kind of thing is the, I know there's people that come out and they kind of have rosy memories of those times, but I think the Hartwells were telling what was really going on. That's it was right. a joke. That's right. It was a joke. And, but he was screaming at people and they were staying in a terrible place. And so anyway, I think they're important because they went public in January, 1980. Uh, the, at that point, people didn't know where Hubbard was. This was a revelation. Oh, he's been he's been in La Quinta making movies. We didn't know that. The press didn't know that. They made a big deal about it. Five weeks later, in right around Valentine's Day, 1980, L. Ron Hubbard went into seclusion and disappeared, and nobody ever saw him again. I mean, there were three or four people with him his last few years, yep. but nobody in Scientology saw him ever again. He went in. He just disappeared. 
Yep. So I, I think the Hartwells <laughs> coming out and talking about what was going on had a huge effect on Scientology history. So that's why I said, you know, you could make the case that they may have been some of the most damaging defectors of all time. Yep. And it was fun to read that story the, the very first time they came out and uh, really interesting people. Now, people have been asking me what happened to their daughter, um, Verdon, who was a messenger. And I'm sorry, I just haven't had time to follow up on that. I'm sure there are people who know I will get into that. I just haven't had a chance yet. Uh, uh, I'm curious too. But uh, yeah, good, good, good on the Hartwells for coming forward. Absolutely, and uh, and always it it really plain spoken, like very. This is how it was, and you get this flavor of like what how what crazy town it was like to have been at that La Quinta location under Hubbard. Uh, and this was after Hubbard had had medical issues. Remember, he had a stroke. He had a, he had various issues in the seventies as well. So this is a time period where Hubbard is. If you read through the writings and advices he was issuing at that time this is when they were re this is when they began the entire process of reorganizing international management what became the corporate labyrinth years later was just getting going of we need to reorganize all this hubbard couldn't even sign things it was signed x that's how you knew it was him uh, the orders and stuff that he was issuing, but he was losing his damn mind uh, at this time. This was he was well along into very delusional, paranoid thinking, and he was absolutely convinced that the CIA, FBI, other alphabet agencies were infiltrating Scientology, had infiltrated LA organization. Um, his writings on it are all from that are all from that time period. Are all absolutely whack, and. And it was this sort of inciting incident, I think, that I think you're nailing it because not only did he go into hiding, but this is also the kind of inciting thing that made him go crazy about the missions and have to extort all the money out of them, which led to the collapse of that entire successful operation. In other words, the Hartwells may well have been a catalyst to the entire change of scientology just going to change from, the whole trajectory that's exactly. right just really change things that's right so i think you're nailing I mean, it look, on look, that. it's not like scientology didn't have successes later obviously in the 90s scientology grew and yep. got taxes and status and all that but you know think about dave in the desert cameraman for ron yep. making films throwing blood on everybody uh you know and just a few years later, it's completely different, you yeah. know, because Hubbard's in hiding. They've they've built up the Gilman Hot Springs thing. Really interesting changes in trajectory. And I think the Hartwells had a lot to do with it because you didn't have a lot of people come out at that time. That's and right. uh, they came out said a few things and wham, it changed a lot, I think. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I really do. And I, and I always point to that time period as the... You know, th there might have been this this th this bit of resurgence in the '90s, but from my perspective, at least, I, I really think that was their peak time was that late '70s, early '80s, because they just destroyed the Golden Goose when they wiped out the missions, and that was where that was the thing that was actually creating this 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 uh, army of young college grad, college kids, Scientologists. Right? They were just coming in, you know, hand over fist. And all of that ended in the 80s, right? And never, and they never really did build that whole thing back up. And Miscavige has seemed to treat it all with disdain now. He doesn't even, pay, he doesn't even try. So, um, so interesting stuff, you know, interesting stuff. So, so quite a few interesting stories here, Tony. Thanks for joining me on this and, and breaking all this down this week. Uh, as I always want to ask, do we have any previews of uh, stuff this week? Yeah, like I, I am following up on the uh, 1994 Germany uh, interview. There's still more to hear about how that came together. Right. Uh, like I just said, I I do need to follow up on the Hartwell story, and 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 uh, I I just haven't had time. There's plenty of people that know all about that. And I just got to talk to them about it. Cool. Um. And uh, I th this week and before too long, we're gonna have some interesting court stuff going on. Right. So always a lot of things to keep an eye on. That's right. Exactly. And who knows who else is coming out. Who knows? <laughs>
All right, folks. Thanks very much for coming around watching us uh, babble on about this. I uh, hope we're keeping you in the loop on what's going on with the Church of Scientology. That will be the effort every week here. And uh, subscribe to Tony's Substack. The address is right there on the screen. And you can get your daily notifications on his stories and uh, and as well as getting our weekly wrap-ups. I will see you guys next week. Bye-bye.